you obviously focus quite a lot on the criminal justice system, policing, right? Uh, and there's clearly a number of ways that those issues intersect with gun rights in America. Um, and we actually have a very recent case that uh, we just had some news on this week, in fact, uh, out of Minneapolis um, with Amir Locke's shooting. Uh, the police officer involved in that case is not going to be charged. Can, can you just give us just a little summation of what happened there and and why this, this officer isn't going to be charged? Uh, yeah, so as I understand it, the police were looking for a suspect in a, a shooting. Um, they uh, obtained warrants to several residences of people who had some sort of connection to the suspect. Um, Amir, Locke, Amir Locke was not the suspect. Right. Uh, I believe the suspect was his cousin. He was staying at his apartment. Uh, and the police uh, conducted a, a no-knock raid on the apartment, uh, or uh, a, a legally a no-knock raid. You know, they claimed they knocked and announced as they were coming in. But for, for the purposes of sort of anybody inside, that's really no different than a no-knock raid. Uh, and Locke apparently reached for, according to the body camera footage, reached for a gun as the police came in and they shot and killed him. Uh, again, he was not the suspect, was not suspected of any criminal activity whatsoever. He just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, you know, the officer wasn't charged because, and he probably, you know, he shouldn't have been because he, the officer saw a, uh, what he thought to be a suspect reaching for a gun. Uh, and usually what happens in these types of cases is the officers are excused because of, uh, you know, the volatility of the situation, because uh, it's a highly sort of dynamic uh, environment with very little room for error. Uh, the problem, of course, is that the police created those dynamics. And, you know, if Amir Locke had shot and killed one of those officers, um, odds are pretty good that uh, he would, <laughs> well, odds are pretty good he'd probably be dead. Uh, and if he had survived, he would probably be charged with some sort of crime. And so even though the police create the dynamic situation, the volatility in the, in, in these raids. Uh, and even though the police sort of had the advantage of knowing that it's what's going to happen and the police had the advantage of being armed and, and uh, uh, you know, wearing ballistics gear. And even though the tactics themselves are designed to sort of disorient and confuse people, when the police make the mistake in these raids, which clearly seems to be what happened here, uh, they're generally given the benefit of the doubt and let off. People on the receiving end of these raids, you know, I, I got my my start in journalism uh, based on a, a case by a, a guy named Corey May, who was raided uh, and shot and killed a police officer and, you know, ended up serving 10 years in prison, uh, including uh, about six years on death row. Um, so the people aren't given the same benefit of the doubt uh, during these raids. And so my, my argument for a long time to the uh, gun rights community Again, which I consider myself a member of, is that if you, you know, really value gun rights, you need to. We need to be uh, speaking out against these types of tactics, and, and that they should only be used in situations where somebody's life is in, at, in imminent risk. Um, to use these tactics for evidence gathering, for investigation, uh, you know, in a country where I don't know what percentage of homes now own guns. Um, you know, there's going to be a lot of mistakes. There are going to be a lot of raids based on dirty information. And so a lot of innocent people are going to get caught up in all of this uh, and are going to be killed or, or are going to kill police officers and, and face criminal consequences for that. Yeah. I mean, certainly the, the Amir Locke situation is obviously the most recent one that's garnered a lot of attention, uh, probably in large part because there was body, body cam footage of what happened. And right. So people can more objectively see exactly how that went down and give the idea that Amir Locke perhaps didn't realize what was happening when, when the police raided the home and it seemed like he didn't wake up immediately. Um, and, and, and then this, uh, series of events led to his death. And, uh, so the critique here is, I guess, um, from what you're saying, not necessarily that the police officer himself, who was the individual, uh, who actually fired the gun was doing anything that was, um, illegal or, um, even necessarily unreasonable. I mean, he had reason to fear for his life, given the gun involved, but right. the problem is the the tactic and the, the setup and, and yep. the way that it um, unfairly disadvantages regular Americans' um, rights. Is that, well, look, is I mean, that correct? Well, look, yeah, you, you, you break into somebody's house while they're asleep, you know, uh, early in the morning or late at night, and you elicit... Um, a very primal reaction to people, right? It's the fight or flight response kicks in. And if you're in your own home, flight isn't really an option. 
And so most people are going to, you know, if they have any kind of protection, uh, you know, if they're, they're armed in any way, they're going to reach for that arm, ar- those arms to protect themselves. And, um, you know, I've seen this, I mean, I've been covering this issue for about 20 years, and I've seen it over, I mean, the pile of, the pile of bodies just keeps growing, uh, people who've been killed in these situations. Um, it just happens over and over and over and over again. Um, and, you know, the interesting thing about it is, or kind of the outrageous part of this, I guess, is that, you know, nobody is ever really, nobody ever really considers uh these tactics from a kind of a a from the perspective of the people who might be inside these houses who are innocent right um when uh, joseph mcnamara who was a a police chief in um, san jose uh, and i believe kansas city for a long time but was a political conservative um worked for the um uh uh, the hoover institute uh, after he retired um in in uh, at stanford um you know, he talks about a conference once he held in Los Angeles about the use of SWAT tactics and no-knock raids to serve drug warrants. Uh, and one of the things I, I interviewed him for my first book, and he's passed away now, uh, but he he talked about this conference where he had, I can't remember everybody involved, he had like a district attorney, a police chief, a, you know, another high-ranking police officer, a judge, uh, and he, he a city council member maybe. And he asked all of them, you know, who should make the decision on what types of when police use these kinds of forced entry tactics. And what he found was that nobody uh, who had the power to kind of restrict these tactics or to consider them from the perspective of anyone other than the SWAT team themselves was willing to say, this is when we should use them and this is when we shouldn't. Uh, And so it basically came down to basically the head of the SWAT team got to decide whether or not the SWAT team was going to be used. And, you know, if you are the head of a unit like that, you want to be used as often as possible, right? You want to be seen as useful. You want to be, you know, productive. You want to be seen as a vital part of the police department. Now, that has changed in some departments, including Los Angeles. They now, there's a threat matrix that some of the larger city police departments go through when they decide what kinds, what types of tactics to use. But that's really only in, you know, uh, a handful of large cities and in in most parts of the country and a lot of these small towns and, and counties, sheriffs that have their own SWAT teams. Um, you know, the decision is really kind of more ha- ad hoc. And, uh, you know, we've seen from surveys done by the ACLU, by Peter Kraska, um, a criminologist in Eastern Kentucky, um, that, you know, somewhere between 75 and 80 percent of these types of forced entry tactics are done uh, to serve warrants uh, for drug crimes. Uh, and so, you know, you're, 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 you've gone from using these ki- types of tactics, this forced entry that at one point were reserved for situations where someone was in the process of committing a violent crime. So you think, uh, you know, domestic violence situation, hostage taking, an active shooter, a bank robber. That's how this was primarily used until about the early to mid 80s, these these types of tactics. Now they're primarily used to serve a warrant on someone who is still merely suspected of a nonviolent consensual crime, right? You're not, the, the person hasn't even, we don't, we're not even sure the person committed the crime yet. We're still investigating because that's the whole purpose of the search warrant. And so you're using these overwhelmingly violent tactics that are designed to sort of dis, to confuse and disorient people where there's very little margin for error and you're using them to investigate often sort of low-level drug crimes that are still in the investigative stage. And that's a, it's a massive shift in how governments have used that kind of force over the course basically of my lifetime. And there's never there was never any sort of discussion or debate about whether, you know, the, the cost benefit of using that kind of tactics, never, met, never mind kind of the more sort of profound civil liberties implications. Uh, and so that's, you know, that's the conversation I think that we've had really since Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, that um, that 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 you know, on a kind of a national level, we hadn't had until that point um, as this shift was taking place.